Hi, I'm Cameron, and I don't just read comics, I love them. On today's episode of Cameron Reads Comics, my friend Russell and I are talking about We Stand on Guard by Brian K. Vaughn and Steve Scross. As I was preparing the episode for this week, I didn't realize that it was coming out the day after a major United States election. You may know the results by now, but this episode was recorded almost a month ago, so I promise the discussion surrounding the book is not overtly political. This podcast and these stories, for me and hopefully for you guys, are means of escapism, so any viewpoint of myself or my guest aren't meant to sway you or weigh down any of your political affiliations. These are just our thoughts in the world we're living in and how it relates to the message of the text that we're reading. Also, just a heads up, my laptop is old and gets tired, so towards the end of the episode, there's a bit of static that comes up, your device isn't going to explode, mine probably will though. As always, we are going into full spoilers for We Stand on Guard. Consider yourself warned. And remember, go follow us on Cameron Reads Comics on Instagram for updates, as well as maybe leaving us a five-star rating review on iTunes. Now, here's your summary for We Stand on Guard. The story opens with a family watching the news. Canada has launched an attack on the United States. As the family talks about who could have been responsible, they look out their window to see a drone strike raining from the sky. Both of the parents die, and the two surviving members are their children, their daughter Amber and son Tommy. The story cuts to the future in which Amber is grown and wandering the Canadian wilderness. She runs into a military robot that looks like a dog and orders her to halt. Amber gets rescued by a civilian militia group. As they tend to her wounds, the group runs into another bot. But this one is the size of a building. The militia group is known as the 2-4. Their coordinated attacks help rescue Amber. Her rescue had a cost, though. The 2-4 lost their Superman-obsessed member, Booth. He was shot in the throat by the pilot of the bot that they took down. Member of the team, Cavani, is so angry that she threatens to murder the pilot. The team decides they are going to be the one to execute the pilot. It has to be Amber. That will prove whether or not she's a conspirator with the war efforts. As they are applauding themselves for their suggestion in making Amber the one to murder the pilot, she unapologetically murders him. Amber doesn't even flinch at all. The group is shocked. When everyone is assigned jobs, Amber asks what she's going to be doing. Chief just tells Amber, Welcome to the 2-4. A flashback reveals the conditions of the United States and Canada post-nuclear strike. The USA have been pillaging Canadian homes and terrorizing their citizens. It's an apparent critique on the United States' imperialism and reliance on military power. Amber and her brother fled from the United States military throughout their youth. In the present day, the United States has been placing all-terrain bots that have been manned into Canada. Any Canadians who have been seen tampering with American pipelines are taken into custody. They are starting to get worried about the insurgency caused by the 2-4 and decide to send troops in that direction. The 2-4 take Amber back to their hideout in a seized U.S. military vehicle. I don't know enough about cars to describe it, but it's basically a tank. When they arrive at their headquarters, the team offers Amber a place to shower and just regroup. This is the first shower she's had in a long time. And not long after that, the team finds out that LePage and Chief are lost outside. Chief was scouting for enemy parachutes and runs into some covert military. They don't kill her, they just capture her. When the team goes out to look for Chief and LePage, they find LePage, but not Chief. They hope for her sake that she's been killed because if she's alive, then she's in trouble. When the story reveals where she is, she's being interrogated by a mysterious figure, a higher up in the United States government. We don't know her name, but we know she's powerful. And she's also gruesome. She'll do anything to get the information that she wants. In order to find out where the rest of Chief's team is, she's going to soak her in a pool of gasoline and burn her alive. But there's a catch. It's not an execution. This is all taking place in Chief's head. So, as her human body will be safe and taken care of, her mind will be experiencing the burning of her flesh and the melting of her face for as long as she can hold out. Over and over and over. Back at the 2-4's headquarters, 
the team is having a hard time reconciling their objectives with their leader in the custody of their oppressors. Dunn decides that he's going to be the new team leader, and that doesn't sit well with Cabani, and as tensions rise, they are about to go to blows. But suddenly, a gunshot goes off, and Amber is standing with the artillery. She forcefully declares that they should put their next move to a vote. Back in holding, Chief has been through several rounds of torture. Because it's taking place in her mind, the government operative can heal her and then set her on fire again and again and again. In one atrocious move, they bring Chief's dad into her consciousness and try to ruin her dad's memory for her. This was Chief's breaking point. Chief gives in and reveals the location of her troop. The officials tell the military to bring their team back into the forest and raid the headquarters of the 2-4. In another flashback, Amber remembers the last time she saw her brother. As a young girl, he sacrificed himself to the U.S. as she hid under the floorboards in a home. Back in the present, the 2-4 is getting all of their gear ready for the invasion. The armed forces burst through the fortress with great ease, and they brought a lot of weapons with them. Their orders are to take no prisoners. The reason that the United States invaded Canada? To get their water. During the invasion, the 2-4 decide that they can't take on this arsenal head-on. They need to get out of there. In a brilliant move, Kabani breaks away from the team, and as they leave, she brings down the mountain base on the government forces, effectively sacrificing herself and saving her team. As the team breaks through the mountain, ensuring their safety, they are greeted by the armed forces with a hostage, though. Done. In a showdown between the government and the 2-4, the U.S. troops threaten to kill Dunn if the 2-4 don't surrender. After some hesitation, they ask what the choice is going to be. Should the Canadian militia open fire, or should they surrender to save Dunn? An impassioned Amber yells to open fire. Back in government custody, the chief works in the fields after such a terrible time being tortured. She meets a man as they work in the fields at a POW camp. The man's name is Thomas, and he offers her kindness and tenderness unlike anyone that she's seen recently. Thomas wonders if Chief has met his sister, Amber. Thomas also reveals that the government official's name, or at least the one they call her, is the American. When they asked about Amber, the Chief doesn't believe she's in somewhere safe. She thinks that they're back in her head. Thomas convinces the chief that she's safe by offering her a candy bar. There's no way someone could have faked or dreamt the taste of something so specific. The chief rejoices at the candy bar and enjoys it. It reminds her of the good old days. She then apologizes to Thomas because she had met Amber, but she recently just gave away her location. To her surprise, Thomas tells her that if the government is on their way to Amber, then Amber isn't the one she should be worried about. Back at the showdown, the team is arguing. Dunn doesn't want them to surrender. He's willing to die. But before they can act, a giant tank bursts through the mountain and lasers in half all of the U.S. military forces. Who could it be? Kabani. She survived. As they all regroup, they realize that there's only one move. A suicide mission. They should take on a fleet of government hel helicarriers. Whatever their next move is, anyways, is a suicide mission as well. At this point, they have nothing to lose. So it begins. Team member Highway and Amber break into one of the U.S. ships and lay waste to a bunch of soldiers. This victory is celebrated only briefly when Highway is shot in the head by none other than the American. When she threatens Amber with the same shotgun used to slay her friend, Amber opens up her jacket to reveal a bomb mounted to her chest. This really was a suicide mission. During their assault on the ground, Dunn becomes critically injured. He knows that it's up to Amber and Highway now. Some good news comes in the form of Kabani and the two force resident celebrity, LePage, getting a signal in order to broadcast to the world. LePage was a celebrity, now turned freedom fighter, so when he gets this platform, his fame can be used to save lives and ignite a revolution. His time with the 2-4 has helped him broadcast that enough is enough. He knows that they may not be able to win the war, 
but winning one battle could be the victory that they need. Back on the helicarrier, the American tries to appeal to Amber. They're not fighting anymore, they're just talking. Except for the fact that Amber has her thumb on a dead man switch. Amber has only one request, get the United States military out of Canada. Amber theorizes that the United States killed their own leader so that they could have a fake reason to invade Canada. Using holographic tech, the American reveals to Amber the real person responsible for the invasion, General Ward, the Canadian Chief of Defense. After severe interrogation, he says that he gave the order to invade and he'd do it again. He believed a preemptive strike could prevent the U.S. from invading. Amber doesn't believe it, but the American tells her the only false idea is that the United States had any interest in invading Canada. Amber's not falling for any of the American's appeals. When a blow from the 2-4 hits the helicarrier they're on, Amber falls and the American tries to make a move on her. She reveals that if Amber blows up the ship that they're on, it'll crash into the last reserve of clean water in the United States and Canada. When Amber asks the American if anything she said was true, the American said it was. Amber says that when you get rid of a kid's parents, that they're not going to get Superman. They're going to get something like her. And then she releases the dead man switch, exploding the helicarrier and crashing it into the reserve. At that point, the United States starts to retreat. They won the battle. Because he has some special resources, Thomas was able to watch it all go down. He saw the 2-4 win the battle, but he knows internally that he lost his sister. Chief comforts him, letting him know that she will be forever one of the greats. In a final flashback, a young Amber is at a farmer's market and loses her family. She's very little, and when she finds them, she admits thinking that she lost them forever. Her mother comforts her by letting her know that they're all right there. Russell, welcome back to Camera Reads Comics. We are so glad to have you. It's been a couple weeks without you. I know. I've I've missed your face. No way. I'm like, <laughs> my mother told me I had a face for radio, so that's why I started the blog. <laughs> that's why we're here. So for the audience, you're welcome for not seeing my face. And Russell, too bad, so sad. Here's my face. So. <laughs> hey, I like seeing it. It's a nice face, Cam. Okay, so Russell, what did we read this week? We read... We Stand on Guard. By the utmost, Brian K. Vaughn. Absolutely. Um, and actually, before we even start talking about this, I wanted to talk to you about um, Brian K. Vaughn and how, you know, I, I really feel like you and I, that's kind of what I keep giving you is Brian K. Vaughn titles. And maybe that's because of uh, what, you know, maybe that's because of our love of saga and why the last man. But my, my question for you, my first question is like, why do you think we keep coming back to Brian K. Vaughn? Why do you think he holds up so well for us? Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I, I, it's probably, probably like more complicated than we even know. Right. Like there's probably just like some aspects where we even miss it, but we know we like it, you know? Yeah. Um, but I think one component, I mean, this is true for why this is true for saga and in this book, right here that like he takes super situations like these larger than life situations and makes them human you know so like as we were talking with saga you know huge space odyssey with intergalactic all this crazy stuff but then here's here are these people and they're people with hearts and souls and motives and desires and they're incredibly human you know and and i think it, it it makes the story enjoyable and readable. Uh, and I think it's the same thing with this book. Like the characters all have, I, I mean, it, it's like what six issues. So you have a limited background, but they all have these backgrounds and they all have motives and they're just people at the end of the day. That's one thing I love about uh, his, his ability to make human situations that seem like they shouldn't be that human. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, even especially with a book like this, it's – and I was explaining it to people because um, I was texting this girl on dating and I was like texting her was, as, as something about this book and I was just like, oh, this is – what if the United States invaded Canada, you know? that's And then she actually gave me her fan theory on why that would happen and I was like, you kind of nailed it pretty close. She, <laughs> But she was like, it's the year 2023 and so she painted a picture of me there. But anyways, talking about We Stand Like Art, I think, I think you're right and I think his – he just satiates this appetite that we have for uh, this content. I just I don't know. I he does it better than a lot of people. I'm just so impressed by him. Yeah, and there's always there's always some deeper component, and it's pretty clear if you're looking closely. You know of, of the commentary that's going on. Sometimes it, oh, sometimes it's subtle. Sometimes it's more obvious. But I like his ability to creatively think through how can I apply situations in the real world today that people go through to this crazy fictional story. And I feel like all of his characters and like the way he does that are so distinct to him because sometimes, and especially with a book like this, I felt like, um, this one nailed it better than a lot. I don't know. It it really was his style. I think that this one was, his characters were always so distinct, his style and his big bombastic moments. Mm. Uh, I actually looked him up and kind of, cause Russell and I were talking about this based on this story. Um, is he Canadian? And the answer is no. He's actually from Ohio, which I think we'll talk about later with the Superman stuff. But he's from Ohio. And then he went to – he said in, when he was in high school, he decided he wanted to be a writer based on – for my comic book fans, Peter David Peter David's Hulk run, which I'm like aching to read. Anyways, read Peter David, everyone. But the uh, he went to New York, uh, NYU. Tish School of the Arts and then he like was studying like film writing writing for film and that's kind of where we got to now and so when you read his style I think number one we noticed that it's so adaptable into being like big cinematic storytelling but it's also just like it's big and bombastic in a very cinematic way that translates so well to the medium of comic books you know so yeah yeah I definitely agree that there's there's certain moments where you know uh uh, a BKV thing's about to happen, and, and but you don't know, you never know what it is. You just know that it's something, and so I definitely agree with you in that yeah. bombastic sense. Yeah, it was just like, man, like this book was filled with so many splash pages. I was like, whoa, this is kind of crazy, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Okay, so let's get into it, Russell. What did What did you think? Did you How did you like this text? How did you like We Stand on Guard? Yeah. Um. I mean, I really enjoyed it uh, thoroughly. I think it's. Maybe I'm just biased at this point that it's going to be really difficult for me to not enjoy something from BKV, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's definitely a somewhat of a different experience for me. I mean, I, I have limited comic experience anyway, but the BKV I'm used to it are like, you know, Why the Last Man, five books of crazy narrative that just goes on forever. And like Saga, it's, it's you know, so ongoing, you know, it's so much he he can do so much with the world and here it's like well, it, the challenge is you're limited by the pages you know um and so i thought it was an interesting read because it was severely different in that sense that it's like the challenge is how much can how much can he tell us about this world about the characters in such a short amount of time and at the same time craft a cohesive narrative and so i think i was pretty impressed by that for the most part yeah, yeah, and, and I think a lot of story was told within, like, only six issues. Like, we, I, mean, I don't know if you just said it on the pod or just said it before, but if it took you more than two sittings to read this, then that's on you <laughs> because it's pretty direct. It's pretty easy read, you know, so I uh, think his ability to fit so much narrative into such little, I guess, con- content, like the amount, mm-hmm. was really impressive. Yeah, yeah, I think even with that, there's – with uh there, there's sort of a sense of mystery because you don't know a lot, you know, mm-hmm. that like the character progression, um, it's not as logical. It's not as predictable. You know, it's like, oh, OK, we have this Amber character. What is she going to do next? Oh, interesting. That's what she did. Hmm. And you're like learning things about these characters without too much of a background about them. You know, and, and so I enjoy that, too. There's There's an element of kind of suspense built within that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I really liked um Actually, that's a question. Here's my next question is, how did you feel about Amber? 
Like her arc was yeah. very like she was. I don't know. I feel like she was the protagonist, but it, it also felt like she wasn't really the protagonist. Yeah, but I mean, who's the protagonist? You know, it's, right? It's, exactly. Maybe maybe they're all sort of protagonists. Maybe <laughs> no one's a protagonist. Maybe just. I mean, Amber is definitely the central figure of the story. So in maybe the classical sense, the protagonist. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought it was. I thought she was such an interesting character. Because you you get all sorts of sides of her. Like at the beginning, I think she's like she's gonna die at the beginning. She's like saved, right? Like oh yeah, yeah. Like you mean the dog, the robot dog. Oh, okay. Is going to if she shoots at it, it's like present your ID card. She shoots at it, and then it's about to like blast her, and then she's saved, right? And then, but she also says, "You speak terrible French." <laughs> Boom! And I was like, "Whoa!" <laughs> was a good I'm like, line. "That's a really important line was that you were leaving out." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. That is an important line. Uh, but so, you, I mean, off the bat, you're kind of like, oh, does she, is she clueless? Like she almost just died at the beginning. Like what's going on? Is she reckless? What's going on? Um, and then you see her like morph to eventually like the at least the head planner at the end, maybe mm-hmm. the leader of this group that she's only known for like a day and a half. Yeah, you know? I feel like this story takes place over two days. <laughs> yeah. And so it, it was just interesting to see kind of that like metamorphosis, I guess, because yeah, at the beginning I'm like, this girl sucks. Like what what's going on? She seems like she doesn't get it. But then she's actually like, oh, she's the leader here. That seemed like those seem like good military tactical moves or whatever on her part. Mm-hmm. So I, I liked the way her character developed over the the narrative. Yeah, what did you what did you think about her? I don't know. I think yeah, I go back to what I was saying at first with I don't know who the protagonist of the story was. Like I and frankly, I didn't know too many of the characters' names. I couldn't like nail those down and so maybe by the time the summary comes around I'll have them all down, but I thought she her arc was very specific, but I actually found her to be kind of vague and not in like a mysterious way that you know, kind of works. I was just kind of like, I don't, okay. So there's the scene when her brother is talking to, I, I forget the one girl the in the chief. Like, yeah. Is the chief. Yeah. He's talking to the chief in the garden or whatever. I, like as they were both prisoners and the, the chief feels bad because she had just literally disclosed the location of, um, her whole team inside the mountain or underneath the mountain, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and the brother says, Oh, I don't know why he says, oh, you shouldn't be worried about them because if Amber's there, then Mm -hmm. you should be worried about the other guys. And we kind of saw some of that, like this deep-rooted anger. And you can understand, like, and I can empathize with her anger towards the government and the whole circumstance in general. Like, I get it. But, you know, and maybe this is an unfair comparison because we had more time with Marco. But I'm like, his anger made a lot more sense to me and, like, why he would be so brutal made more sense to me than hers because i felt Mm. like amber's was just kind of like she'd lash out or oh boom she's like carrying a dead man switch (laughs) just randomly and i was like oh you're kind of really hostile but i i just feel like it's maybe it's for the sake of survival maybe it's for other things but i really didn't i kind of couldn't understand her yeah yeah i get that Uh, i wonder I, i think i read part of that as you know she's she doesn't really have she has maybe one thing left to live for because uh, to her this this whole war and the americans are the ones to blame for the death of her father mother and ma- she has no clue what, where her brother is the death of her brother she doesn't know you know yeah. or or the torture or whatever and so she's we we pick up on her story and she's alone and isolated and i feel like the only thing left to live for is the cause of uh, I mean, call it justice, call it revenge, whatever, but yeah. um, getting back at and rectifying in some small way the situation. And there's sort of like a, um, what's the word? What's the word? Where like you're, uh, everything's going to go bad in the end. Like everything's going to be, you're going to die in the end. I want to say like nihilism. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Yeah. She's kind of like a nihilist in that like, yeah. I think she even realizes like she can't just win the war or something, but she's like, hey, I can take this suicide vest and go blow up this huge 
part, like this huge, I don't even know, sky base or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, really, like, literally, <laughs> it was sci- sci-fi mumbo jumbo, like, <laughs> transportation, but that's kind of the fun. Of, like, I, I know that's also the most fun. Yeah, exactly. But, but to her, that's like, ah, oh, that's enough. That's yeah. what I'm going to have. So it is reckless, um, but I wonder if it's just because, like, yeah, she has nothing going for her. Yeah. You know? And we, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, this is bad. I, I realized after I asked you that question, I probably should have asked you this one before because I was like, okay, let's get into deep character stuff. But I guess, you know, we love the way Brian K. Vaughn, uh, I guess, plots out his stories and his pace and, you know, how he, his use of time. And, you know, this was obviously a broken timeline, but mm-hmm. how did you feel about the intro of this um, text or this story when, it kind of painted a picture where, wow, we this is going to be about a family. And then auto- automatically it went to, boom, like this, I guess it's a soft family moment. They're all together. Parents are trying to explain what's going on in the world to their daughter. Then they look out the window and they are getting fired on. The dad dies, tells the son to take care of his sister. And it kind of launches from there. How did you feel about that? As opposed to... Lately, I've been reading stories, or especially for the podcast, that have just been like, boom, we're dialed up to 11, we're going now. How do you feel about this kind of Brian K. Vaughn pace? Because I feel like that's very true to who he was. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's a that's a good question. Um, I think I like, well, it's sup- it feels super necessary to kind of see the the somewhat peaceful start or that things were at one time normal so your characters have known normalcy they know what that's like Ooh. you know um it's not like i don't know in the road or, or, or something where like the kid doesn't even know what normal is because he's lived in the apocalyptic time the whole time or something what is this sh- what are you referencing the, cormac mccarthy's the road i'm not that deep russ it's okay i'm like if there's a comic know. book adaptation i'm there <laughs> uh there's a movie I'm gonna check out the movie though. It's 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 got uh, Aragorn in it. He's the lead. Oh, like v- Viggo Mortensen. Yeah, exactly. Okay, <laughs> I'm like I can name actors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, the but the reference there is his kid in that. I'm pretty sure like has only known the apocalyptic world. Yeah, right. And so um, it's kind of I thought it was necessary to like see that like the beginnings that at least these kids have have seen normalcy, you know? And we see that. I think it's consistent too is with why the last man, you know, it really is the first issue is kind of a countdown for Mm -hmm. everything that's about to happen. And I think, and that's why it rang rang true. Like, like I said earlier, just stylistically, it it flows with his body of work where he kind of gives you a hint, but I guess you're right too. Like that you get that normalcy because some other stories will do like, um, work their way back from, you know, the, the big bombastic thing and they'll work their way back to normalcy as opposed to knowing what the world was like, this thing happens, and then trying to, I guess, to seek that out or rectify whatever's going on, uh, either to themselves or to the world. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good comparison with why I think too. It is, it's very similar in that style. Uh, it's kind of, this is just done in way fewer pages, right? It's like two pages of normalcy versus the, yeah, the kind of full issue countdown. Mm-hmm. One thing that I did uh, notice this time reading through uh, that I really liked was actually maybe before the first page, I guess, the just the listing of the uh, Canadian National Anthem yeah, and with the We Stand on Guard, uh, the final We Stand on Guard just like highlighted and stuff. Uh, I, I don't know why, but this I do, I like that, that stuck out to me as like, first of all, it's interesting that to like pay attention to a line in any national anthem because who actually pays attention to the lyrics in their national anthem and like thinks about what they are about oh dang you're messed up russ i know all the words to star spangled banner <laughs> you know, yeah but like you're like oh friggin uh yeah right <laughs> give me even like you have to say i can't even pick oh, out say a, does that star spangled banner yet yeah, wait <laughs> yeah like what's happening over the land of the brave <laughs> of the yeah. brave russ. by the I, way that word's over yeah, so okay. that should tell you everything you need to know. <laughs> Dang, Russ. Uh, I'm like, anyways, anyways, transitioning out of that one. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I was gonna ask. Well, you did. I think I'm. I'm curious. What were your early page? Was it just the Why Last Man comparison? Oh, and stuff? The int- yeah, yeah. The the introduction. 
I found to be. I just thought this was this was just kind of like stylistic, well, stylistically Brian K. Vaughn's best hits. You know, I think I think his use of splash pages was really unique. I really like the Canadian national anthem and the We Stand Our Guard thing too because it kind of was like it added context and um, it felt very reminiscent because I don't know you and I are pretty young and I I was only in. I think we were both in first grade when 9-11 happened. And mm-hmm. it was just kind of like that moment of your parents having to explain kind of something going on in the world to you because you're so unclear. Uh, I feel like we've lived that in or for, totally. for that example, or even just any kind of whatever politi- political socio s- happening. Um, it felt very reminiscent. And I thought that was a very natural thing. And that's why I was kind of like, Oh, this is going to be a family story. And then it totally wasn't. And I actually wanted to chime in on the art of the book too, because I think, um, help me out too. If you know better than I do, it's pronunciation, but I think the artist's name is Steven uh, Scroogey. Sounds good to Steve me. Steve Scrooge. Um, but I thought there, your, your copy is different than mine. I read the hardcover and Russ read the, the soft cover, but I thought the, the art was so telling about this story. Like I just thought it was so beautiful. Like the, the cover of the hardcover is like one of the gorilla's arms. Like, so a big, Mecha machine arm. Oh yeah. And then oh you're oh my gosh, look Mine's you're crazy. But look, your is different than mine. Oh yeah. Look at the boot. Oh that's crazy. We just yeah. found out okay, sorry. So I have the hardcover and Russ is the paperback, but the um the image on the back too I thought was so telling, which is actually Russell's cover, but the boot is different on the like, soft cover it has the American flag. On mine it just has a star. So wow. <laughs> that's a, maybe it's not that big of a deal to announce it, but I think it's a big deal. <laughs> I just thought the art was very cool and very like, I don't know, ominous. And so with the intro being what it was, you know, I compare it to what everything else I've read by him. But I also thought that it was, whoa, you know what I mean? I feel like we weren't set up and it caught me off guard, which is kind of good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, I was ready to dig in. I thought even with the, you know what I loved, frankly, um, going back to his characters, I guess after if you still, I think this is issue number one. I'll count that as the introduction. Um, when she meets the French actor, and I like read the read this with the um, I Google Translate because I don't know French, and so he says after they saw like there's the little dog that came, then there's the big like gorilla thing, and he was like, oh yeah, like merci beaucoup, but. I almost peed my pants. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> and it made me laugh. And I was like, I like that guy a lot. <laughs> yeah. I, I like, that was one of my, probably one of my favorite characters just cause I love the idea of, Hey, if like there's just this crazy war and like, well then none of the things that used to matter matter. Right. Meaning if you were a movie star, who cares anymore? You're in a crazy gnarly war. So maybe now that guy is just like, part of the war effort you know yeah. and so i kind of liked uh i like that character just for that that kind of weird creative reason yeah and i thought their use of him was very fascinating mm-hmm. and especially you know how you see the american getting all whoa he's with them blah blah blah. like it was wild and yeah. i was like oh man i you know you don't think about it but then we see it on a daily basis you know celebrities taking a political stance or something and using their platform and maybe using that to motivate people in any sort of direction, which I thought was very uh, unique. Yeah, totally. Um, who was your favorite character then? Uh, that's a great question. I think there's, you know, it's this one for me, it's pretty hard to, to pick one. Um, one of the characters I really enjoyed was the brother. Yeah. Uh, and I like the brother because he's, he's a side character really. But he has like, all, yeah, five lines. Yeah. But he's like, pretty important and um i i like one of my favorite scenes i think is the one where he he's sacrificing himself for his sister um and and that being very telling for her narrative moving forward um yeah and, and also just his kind of place as he's he sort of represents one of these people who have been captured in the war effort he's like a uh not like a failure, but you know, he, he failed to, like he was kept, like he lost. He, he, he's a loser in a, not like he sucks, but Dang. like, he, like he lost and then he was captured and, but he's still, uh, an advocate for the effort and he's still paying attention and tracking it. 
um, and seeking to track his sister even in captivity. Yeah, and even to the sake of putting himself in danger for that because some of the, I guess, tech or whatever that he had was not allowed. Right. It was dangerous. Exactly. Yeah. And um, yeah, and he seemed like like you get these really small pieces of uh, his character and what it could have been like his relationship with his sister, that he's probably a pretty smart guy, that he knows how to convince the chief that they're not in a dream simulator by giving her the the candy to eat to, like oh you can't fake the taste you know uh, just like a small moment like that was like i i thought pretty cool and, and um that he was kind of able to have a connection with you know the amber of the past as a sibling but then also to experience the amber of the future all the way up to her death through uh, the chief there. That was like the connecting factor. So yeah. I, I kind of just like that that component of it. And, you know, it's really nice to see. He was a, uh, maybe, you know, and, and I guess maybe this is an outlier in Brian K. Vaughn's body of work and even some other indie comics just in general, but you never quite get a consistently like morally upright character. You know, mm-hmm. I'm like trying to think. And then even in Saga, we had some, you know, characters lash out and were human and normal. But in, um, even in Why the Last Man, some characters are human and normal, and like you know, they're they're imperfect. But it was nice to have in in such a war torn book of you know really sorrow, and I don't I would argue that the ending of the story isn't a happy one. Um, to see such a morally upright character and kind of be a compass and like a an anchor into some part of humanity, that being her brother, I think was so useful. And in its minimal time in the text too, it was uh, really uh, special. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. That, and I think you're right in saying. I mean, I didn't see anything that he did wrong or yeah. was scummy about or anything. Yeah, he's like, here's a candy bar. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, and also he's just like a side character in prison. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like that. That is pretty interesting. That that's the person you choose to make the pure figure yeah. is the one who kind of doesn't have an impact on the the direction of the story necessarily, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then um, I think. My favorite character was the American because oh, – well, she's also very reminiscent of um, a DC Comics character. Russell, have you seen Suicide Squad? The movie? Yeah. Yes. It's very like, – like Viola Davis in Suicide Squad plays uh-huh. a character called Amanda Waller. And I think that there's a heavy draw from something like that. Uh, it's just a character that really kind of knows – it's like you know how there's cheesy – uh, action movies where it's like, ooh, even the president doesn't have this level clearance and blah, blah, blah. There's <laughs> those, like Illuminati kind of thing going on. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Amanda Waller is very much one of those characters. And the American was very much one of those characters in this text where it's like she understands the motivation of America and she understands the motivation of everyone. And I found – I also recently like this week watched Inception or like last weekend or something. <laughs> and, and like them torturing them in dreams, I was like, wow, that is very much like – that's hitting a little extra deep right now. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so um to be able to see that happen. I just thought that character was mm. very interesting. And like to find out, which I thought was kind of cheesy, but really like well done, I think, to find out that she was once Canadian too. I was like, yeah. ooh, that's very I like that a lot. I was about to ask you how you I, felt about that. I was like, I don't know. At first I was like, ah, eh, like really? Like we kind of had to do that, but then I think it was the right move, you know what I mean? And so to see, I think that very ending moment too with her and Amber at the end on the, you know, hullabaloo ship that sci-fi, you know, all of it. Um, I like sky base. Literally (laughs) sky captain, the world of tomorrow ship. And they're on that. And I'm like, I just thought that that interaction was really well done. And to see her receiving orders to you from like the secretary of state was very interesting. I just found the whole that whole character, like everything she was doing and motivated by and like how scary and like also she kind of did have a heart too because she's like, ooh, we don't want to kill Chief, you know, after she had given up that information that was so personal. It, but it was also super scary and she's like, oh, what they were using the dream machine to do was so messed up. And so mm-hmm. I don't know. It just – I feel like in a very same way, my, my infatuation and my love for Prince Robot the Fourth and Dango is very similar to this character, too. I'm just like, I think the, I think Frank K. Bond does villains so well. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, ooh, I'm, I'm, 
what are you going to do next? I'm always paying attention to those characters. You know? Yeah, they're complicated. Yeah, she was a very complicated character. And uh, I, I think she was intentionally, like, it's super ambiguous, you know? And, yeah. And you don't know, like, even at the end where she's like, oh, well, guess who actually burned down the White House? It was this Canadian, yeah. whoever the heck it was, you know? Mega general of Canada. <laughs> yeah, and then Amber's like, you're lying. And then it's like, well, maybe, who, <laughs> you know? Um, there, that, yeah, she's had that ambiguous factor kind of just revolving around her and i do love that yeah you do have you raise some inter- there's some interesting things to think through of like okay she's like kind of the worst because like at one point she goes against the protocols and says like run this program yeah or else and it's not legal to do it or whatever yeah and then so it's like oh that's so messed up but then it like works out for her and then yeah like the chief is just sent to like the labor camp she's not like executed yes, or something that's what it sounded like was gonna happen yeah and so you're like and, and then she's like play her some peaceful music and it's like what the wait what is your like, you literally <laughs> just said that chick's face on fire <laughs> yeah, exactly it's like is she you you have compassion sort of but like you super also don't in some moments like uh it, it is very hard to track with um and there's something that's that's again pretty human about that right yeah and i i just thought you know, I and villains are always super interesting. I I don't I don't know. I love the heroes, obviously, and we'll we'll get into that when I talk about favorite moments. But um, this villain I thought was really well done and very complicated, and I liked. I just really liked the arc that this character went on. So, um, yeah, that was mine. So, Russ, I guess next question: What's your favorite moment? What was it? Yeah. Um. One one moment. Uh, this is kind of like a smaller moment, but to me, it, it felt like significant. And maybe this is just like some stuff that I like think through or, or I like. Um, but I like the moment there where they figure out the the the. This is the brother and the chief in the labor camp, and they figure out like, oh wow, they like they did it. They blew up the sky base, and um, he's like really pretty devastated because he knows oh she like died, uh, and then she the chief comes over. And says something along the lines of like, you know, she's going to be remembered as a war hero. Like she's going to go down in history. Uh, Like she'll be glorified in history for her efforts, you know. Uh, And I really like that moment because uh, to me that kind of raises the question of, um, well, a few questions. But one, it's like the, the disparity between motive and result, you know, because... I don't think Amber's motive is to be remembered in history, you know? Yeah. And then, but maybe that is her result. Her motive is really just an act of vengeance, maybe. But then the result is now she's like a war hero for that. Maybe she is remembered in history, you know? And, and then you think about her brother too. It it, it kind of raises the question of like, what's the importance of a legacy? What's the importance of achieving glory? Because for her brother, it seems like, zero importance because she's now gone i would trade a legacy for her presence with me right now for five minutes you yeah know? um and i like that i and i yeah i like that idea maybe part of that's like the hamilton musical who lives <laughs> who dies who tells your story it's like uh but i like thinking through that of well what does it matter if she's gonna have a legacy what does it matter if she achieves some sort of glory if it ended it like if it ended her life and she can't experience it and she's her life is cut short because of that you know it's it's an interesting question i think uh, uh, an important note on that too is the intention of a legacy and maybe uh i think there's an argument to say that most notable figures in history aren't necessarily trying to I mean, uh, this is for amber especially but i don't think she's trying to be remembered in history she's she's motivated by an idea and a cause and that is maybe more important than you know well, obviously to her, but to the point mm-hmm. of her legacy in general is that she died for a cause. And that's uh, reminiscent, again, of Saga. If you guys haven't already under like listened to our three-episode series on Saga, go check it out. But for this one, it's um, we're obviously very reminiscent because it's the same author. Anyways, <laughs> that's just a quick plug. Um, that for, uh, for her, the idea of an idea being the most important and you can't destroy an idea. They're so dangerous. They're so deadly and to the point where someone's willing to live or die based on an idea. I think 
when you think about characters in history is we don't remember them for wanting to be famous. We remember them for their uprightness and what, what they stood for. And so I guess going back to Hamilton, cause that's obviously while we talk about the American invasion of Canada, we also talk about the foundation <laughs> of America um, yeah. in rap form. But, um, them just the, standing for an idea, I think is a uh, very important and the intention of a legacy because whether or not someone intends their goal is not necessarily to be remembered, but it's, it's for the idea to be remembered. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, that's a great point. And, and then with that, yeah, it's the question of how important is the idea, you know, like can an idea be important enough to die for? Uh, so dang, we're getting so deep right now. <laughs> um, it's like maybe. Yeah. Pro- probably. Right. Yeah. Um, there's something, yeah. It's like, yeah. Their idea is worth, you know, sacrificing for in, in worthwhile things. Uh-huh. Yeah. But what if I'm curious if you were to label um, Amber's idea here that she's dying for, what would that be? Because I feel like that's like we want to answer that's that. what's really like because, I mean, if you go to like Hamilton or something, it's like, oh. You know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Protect yeah. the individual rights or whatever it is, you know. Well, I mean, we're also about to sing for us. <laughs> uh, but, like, for Amber, I feel like, yeah, I feel like she's standing for something or a couple things. But also, I've, I have I, You know, I think, know. I think hers is really vengeance. And that's why we were kind of struggling with maybe her it, 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 being a protagonist. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons that I kind of was unclear about her. Mm-hmm. Um that's an airplane going by if you can hear it. Um, but with, uh, I'm, I think her idea is that you can't like, I, I think the number one biggest motivator for her was like vengeance. First and foremost, like you guys killed my parents. What else did you think was going to happen? You think I was going to go down easy? Um, why does the United States think they can take? And I think a lot of this was a big commentary on like American imperialism and just trying to. Oh, totally. Yeah. And I think it was going against that idea. I'm like, why did you think you could do this to us? Or uh, the the path that you're going on, you are now, and it's revealed later in the story that America's main motivation is through, you know, because they used up all their natural resources. Um, they are now going to Canada and trying to, take theirs or use theirs. So I don't know. I, I think maybe it's like maybe her, her stance is kind of the anti-American way. And maybe that's worth dying for, for the sake of prosperity of all nations, but mm. even more so to her, something even bigger to her for the sake of her family still being alive. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's, that's good. Yeah. That's what, that's what I think of. Yeah. It, it reminds me of, uh, it feels like to me one of the things that's going on too is like I don't know maybe this is a misinterpretation of what's I going on. I don't know but if anything I just said made sense. That so. made sense to me. Thank you, um, and that's all I want. But I feel like there's also something going on where it's like Amber has her subjective experience of what's happening, right? Her subjective experience is I saw these people rain down bombs on my city mm-hmm. and kill my parents. And take my brother away. That's my subjective experience of the Americans, right? Um, and so, obviously, like, yeah, the I and maybe part of the idea is these people are evil. Like, they, I've seen them do evil things, mm-hmm. so I'm going to fight against the evil people, right? Um, but there's, I, I mean, I kind of read it in the end with like, you know, the Americans saying, "Oh, actually, you people started it or whatever," and like they have a, you're like siding with Amber, but then you're also like. But I also feel like I can't be sure about what Amber's what Amber's saying here, you know? Yeah. And I feel like there's also this point where it's this idea of accepting that in certain, um, not in life, right? But in certain circumstances, the objective truth of what happened might be unknown to you, you know? Um, like, mm. you know what I mean? Like, okay, so, you know, my my dad tells me some story of, yeah. of his experience of what happened a week ago, you know, and I can like experience that side of the story subjectively, but I don't have the objective overall yeah. understanding because I was not there. I could not mm-hmm. experience it, you know, 
there, it, it feels like there's part of that. Yeah, which makes, you know, the main goal, the main point, the idea that, you know, maybe she dies for is unclear, you know? Mm-hmm. Because, I, I don't know, I thought the character was unclear anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Because obviously I've also never had any of those experiences. <laughs> right. Cam, what was your favorite moment? Okay, actually my favorite moment was, I guess it's a cop-out answer, but there's two favorite moments that I have. Number mm-hmm. one was when, um, uh, it's when they keep referencing Superman. Um, uh, yeah, I read that thinking of you. Okay, and actually, this is why it's kind of relevant and funny, and there's actually Easter eggs in here, and that's why I think it's so cool. But, um, so who was the one guy? The guy died in like 2.5 seconds that mentioned Superman was Canadian. Booth. His Booth. name is Booth. I literally, oh, also, fun fact for the readers, I don't know if I said this earlier, this is the first book for the podcast that I had never read before. So this is my first time reading it. Russell is actually a resident professional on this because – did you read it two or three times? This is my second time. Oh, but I definitely you. feel way superior to you in every way right now. <laughs> he so. knows everyone's name and I'm like, yeah, the guy got blown up. And then, <laughs> oh my gosh, the friend in the Canadian Superman like Maple Leaf shirt that, oh, got, yeah. that, that got murked too. I'm like, wow, what, what's the point of everyone wearing Superman dying? Anyways. Um, so, <laughs> so the It's Superman, ironic, right? It really is. I'm like they're not invulnerable like Superman is. Um I thought that with Superman being – he's a complicated character in general just like in his fruition because what they were mentioning is all like super deep cuts because when when the blonde dude, Booth, mentions it the first time, he says – he says that Superman is Canadian, be- and he's like, oh, I thought he was from Ohio. Number one, Brian K. Vaughn from Ohio. But Jerry Siegel, who is you know, the writer of Superman, he is from Ohio. He's from Cleveland. Then, um, but Jer- uh, Joe Schuster is the guy that they were mentioning who is from Canada. And I looked it up. He is from Toronto. So Superman being exclusively um, Canadian – it's very funny, and I'm pretty sure, don't quote me on this, but the idea of Superman being about truth, justice, and the American way, that quote is from the Richard Donner Superman film, which DC had pretty much taken the rights from both of those creators of Superman. They stole the IP and gave them no royalties. And so one of mm. the biggest deals about the Richard Donner Superman movie is that for the first time, it said in the opening credits, if you ever watch them, Superman created by... Joe Schuster and Jerry Siegel, it's a very big deal. <laughs> and they, they had actually just finished a lawsuit where those guys got all of the royalties or like a percentage of the royalties, which frankly added up to about $20,000, which if you think of the IP that Superman is, mm-hmm. it is worth well over $20,000, <laughs> yeah. you know? And so um, it was just... All of those things, and and personally, like I've talked about, I wrote papers on Superman being reminiscent of Hercules through like the Twelve Labors and holding up, you know, like Hercules as a baby, like choked out some snakes. It was dope. It's also in the Disney movie. And then, I remember that. <laughs> I'm like, that's what I'm saying. And then number two is Superman also being an epitome of he's as much jewish as he is canadian because both of those kids were jewish kids in the middle of the of world war ii writing a hero with the same origin of moses mm-hmm. so yeah i've done a lot of talks on that so superman being like reminiscently jewish and then also you know i think what he's saying about canadian like being canadian is right too i like do really agree with some of those points that they were talking about and so i was like huh like It's very cool to see – I just – with all those deep cuts, you know what I mean? That's all super Mm -hmm. special to me. And so with all those points being true about Superman being Canadian Canadian and um, Jewish for all intents and purposes, I thought it was very special. It was very neat to Mm -hmm. see like um, like that being referenced by Brian K. Vaughn who actually like references Superman multiple times in Ex Machina, which is another series he did. Uh, So – and then – being mentioned again as a – by the American when she's talking about why are we always so obsessed about the messianic, like, fictional hero. She's like, you know, Superman doesn't exist, right? And I just thought that – I don't know. I thought it was very tasteful. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I liked it. Mm-hmm. That you said – so were those 
the two Superman moments, or did you have another no, non Superman? No, that was my favorite. The two parts. Of, okay, got it. Was it. Like, yeah, I was like, yeah. What, both times he's mentioned, uh-huh. I just really liked it. And I, uh, in episode six of the podcast, my buddy Jack and I talked about just like your culture, like validating other parts of your culture. So, you know what I mean? Hip hop re- referencing, uh, superheroes i just think i'm like i'm getting validated in two mediums that i adore you know what i mean mm-hmm. they're validating each other and yeah. so i think this while it being a comic book the the idea of this comic book referencing just one of the true pulp heroes like of the entire medium the, the medium defining you know hero frankly uh i think that was very special and mm-hmm. that's why I was like, ooh, and I was so drawn. And then it's like Easter egg layers. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, yes, I'm just about it. So yeah. that was my favorite moment. Now, Russ, I guess I got like two more questions for you. Um, how did you – how do you feel about this story being accessible for new readers? And what – how accessible do you think it is? Yeah, it's, it's – it's, I mean this is kind of how I felt about Saga and, and why as well, that they, these are new stories. So they're pretty accessible because – um, you don't need to have any background knowledge, really. Um, I do think that they require like an open mind to some extent. Like, uh, yeah, there's certain ideas that you need to be able to be okay with. Uh, and at least you should be able to allow something provocative to be said to you and for you to not get like super offended or something by that. But I think besides that, it seems pretty accessible to me. You know? Yeah, and I think it does – In I think most texts and just content that you're receiving should require a critical lens. You know, you should be critical. Just think, I don't know, just think through, uh, you know. yeah. maybe America's not perfect. And maybe this is a, a reflection of maybe that imperfection and uh, obviously an over over dramatization of, uh, habits that we've previously had. Yeah. Maybe we still do have, you know, yeah. that's up to you, uh, to dictate that for yourself. But I think, yeah, and I, I don't know. I just love, uh, a story like this where I'm like, I can just hand it to someone. You don't need to know anything about anything. You can just, or except for what USA and Canada are, but you can go read that and explore after that, you know, and yeah. it's up to you. Yeah. And it's like, well, maybe Brian K. Vaughn's not literally saying America is going to send robot dogs to Canada, you know? So I mean, you can never be too sure though. That's true. What would you rate this tax out of 10? Um, that's good. A good question. Uh, I'm going to go with a 7.75. Wow. I think you're higher than I am. I think honestly, I'm like a seven, just clean 7.0. I thought it was good. Not like the best thing I've ever read, but it's hard when you, you know, we've read his entire body of work and I think that we also are kind of spoiled in what we kind of receive. You know, I we're spoiled in the fact that we are reading this long form and not month to month. And I think all those hits would hit differently if we were reading them, you know, on that kind of timeline. Yeah. Hmm. So Queen Seven. I think you were you were more than me for Saga, but I'm I'm more than you for this one. That's and eventually we I promise guys, we will do a Why the Last Man. But in the meantime, next time Russell's gonna be on in the next several weeks for you guys. Uh, where I gave him the Snaggle exit stage left the Snagglepuss Chronicles because I read that and it coughed me out. It 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 coughed me. Coughed it coughed off me guard. off guard. It caught. That's me a off, great expression. Like you were so me. caught off guard that you just let out a cough. In these day and age, coughs are dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I'm like, That's a very provocative statement. <laughs> <laughs> but um. Snagglebus caught me off guard. It was so good. And so within the next several weeks, I gave it to Russ. He's going to read it over. We're going to talk about it. Make sure to tune in next week. And then always, as always, follow us on the Camera Reads Comics Instagram to find out what I'm listening to and what I'm reading. Um, Alrighty. Well, see you guys next time.